and identify the distribution of the verbal systems. And then we'll end up talking about Proto-Bantu, uh, as Derek has proposed, how it relates to what we've seen before that. And then um, Derek's question about why raised certain interests in me, so I have some speculation that I will offer just to, to stimulate your thoughts about it. So let's first frame the question. Uh, the question basically is where was tense innovated? This tense is so pervasive in the Bantu system. Uh, it's been assumed, of course, it started at Proto-Bantu, whatever that line was. But uh, this, is, this is the question now that Derek raised in his 2008 book, and it stimulated and motivated me to look at this uh, more carefully through the Bantuoid region. So was it in innovated at the early Bantu or pre-Bantu context, or even proto-Bantoid, or even something earlier than that, like Bantoid cross? These are questions that Derek was asking in his 2008 work. So this study is trying to attempt to answer that question. One of the key assumptions here is this that, that uh, Derek, uh, Derek also points out, is that proto-Niger Congo is assumed to be uh, aspect prominent. It's not a tense aspect system, but aspect prominent. Uh, as he mentioned, aspect comes first. And it's interesting, studies in, in uh, pigeons and creoles, often that's, those languages start with aspect, not tense. Aspect seems to be a more basic form, as we see in a number of language families, too. So we're going to look at this fantastic uh, contrast that you take eastern or western part of Niger-Congo, which has predominantly aspect prominent languages. There are some tense languages that show up, but predominantly aspect prominent. And then you come over to Bantu, and essentially it's all tense systems in the Bantu region. And I take those in, that pieces of information from Derek's uh, 2008 work, which is a monumental work on tense aspect in Bantu. I hope some of you read that and benefited from it. So the current hypothesis <clears throat> is Nurses 2008. He says, whether the innovation of the I use square brackets for what I put in to just fill in taking information from uh, earlier in his book. Whether the innovation started in one of the, one of the narrow Bantu, grass fields Bantu, or lower cross river, and spread to others later, or whether it was an innovation shared at some level of Bantoid cross river tree cannot be determined until we know more about of the distribution uh, distribution and nature of tents in grass fields in southeastern Nigeria. So that's what we're going to do, try to do in the next few minutes, or give at least an overview of uh, answer to that distribution question. It is unlikely that different subsets of Bantu innovated the general phenomenon of tents reference at different times and places in eastern and central Africa. Since we can be fairly sure of that, but not sure when tents was innovated in grass fields, Bantu, and Cross River, it would seem most likely in the present state of knowledge that tense was innovated within the community ancestral to today's Bantu languages. And elsewhere, Derek would also put it as sometimes in Bantoi Cross River, elsewhere in that uh, the 2008 work. Oops. So <coughs> following uh, Derek, we'll look for the distribution of verbal systems, um, recognizing that Niger-Congo if, if the expansion of this language family was from, from the west to east, they carried with them primarily aspect prominent languages. And we would then refer to the Bantoid Cross River groups, look at those, uh, within East Benue Congo. So this brings us now to the question about uh, Benue Congo, and particularly the new Benue Congo. The, the East Benue Congo is the, old, is the new term for what used to be called Benue Congo. But the new Benue Congo includes the Kwa languages that weren't originally uh, listed. So those of you who have looked at the Wolf's you know, study of noun classes in Benue Congo, that's essentially the study of what's now called East Benue Congo. So let's situate Benue Congo. This map here, this is an area uh, where the Niger and Benue rivers is a confluence of these two rivers. And Williamson and Blench suggest that this is the likely is plausibly the homeland area of Benue Congo. And the first split were the West Benue Congo, Yoboid, uh, Yoboid, uh, Edoid, Yuboid, and so forth, heading off primarily to the southwest. Then the East Benue Congo divides into the Kainji, up into the northwest from there, to the northeast and plateau. And then east and south of the Benue, the Jukanoid, 
and then Bantoid Cross, which then divided <coughs> the Cross River, coming down here along the Cross River to the coastal area, and also crossing some the Cross River some, and then Bantoid here, and spreading into Cameroon, and then becoming Bantu here, Bantu coming out along along the Senegal River, Sen Senegal River Valley, and spreading from there. So these are numbers associated with East Benue Congo. About, about 60 percent of the languages of Niger Congo are East Benue Congo languages. And you can see the distribution here, approximate distribution, Central Nigerian. These are uh, categories that Williamson and Blench used in 2000. Uh, Kainji had 59, Plateau, Jukonoid, and then Cross River, and Bantoid. And it divides, of course, into this uh, wider Bantoid and this huge Bantu group. <laughs> That's uh, probably almost a third, a third of all the Niger Congo languages are in Bantu. And the location on the map, so up here in this number one in Nigeria, you have the Kainji, and number two is the Plateau region. Then three are the Jukonoid, four over here is the Cross River coming down <coughs> to the coast, and then the Bantoid starting here, coming into Cameroon, and then the one family within with subfamily within Cam uh, Bantoid, being the Bantu that have spread, of course, across Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa today. So that's situating it in terms of Benue Congo and East Benue Congo. The methodology is just kind of repetitions, a couple of things that Derek said, is that we're going to be distinguishing aspect prominent from tense aspect prominent systems, and we're I'm using basically Comrie's publications and aspect and tense in terms of definition of those, as uh, Derek was. The, also, the issue, the, the same thing that Derek mentioned, is the inverse of what the Indo-Europeans can do when they can build things up from the bottom, one group at a time. Uh, we don't have the data, we don't have descriptions of all the languages that are listed there, so we have to take examples, and from those examples, infer what might be for the whole group and they may be wrong in certain cases, but that's what we work from is this inference process. Pro the Proto-Niger Congo was an aspect prominent system is an important assumption to make, and that aspect is more basic than tense. In other words, it's, I don't think we've ever found a language that only had tense and had no aspect, as an example, but we have found a lot of languages around the world that only have aspect and no tense. <coughs> so what we'll, of course, know, and we, you, you are well aware of, the Bantu is rich in tenses, the Bantu languages. So here are the models I'm, I used to look at the work of somebody on a given language and try to evaluate what they were talking about when they talked about the verb system. So this is a model for an, attempt for an aspect prominent language. It's basically going to have a perfective and imperfective. It may have other subcategories of imperfective. It's going to have the perfect and potential or something for the future, some kind of marking probably, or it might be using both similar, similar imperfective for both present and potential, and you, you derive it from the context. So that is the aspect prominent, contrasting it with the tense aspect system, where you have perfective and imperfective. You have the aspect markers here, I mean categories, but you have tense now. You have past, present, and future or maybe future, Mark, uh, in some particular way. Usually what you expect is to have a past perfective and a past imperfective, a present perfective, a present imperfective, a future perfective, a future imperfective. You expect that kind of systematic presentation. So let me make a few other comments here. The formal marking of time for, um, versus the default reading, interpretation of time. So. In a tense system, we know time is actually being marked. We can see what they're talking about. But in an aspect prominent system, it isn't that people don't, can't infer time. We do it all the time when we use an aspect system. So the perfective, this default reading, if it's not marked otherwise, is going to be past tense. Past time is what we're talking about with the perfective. And the imperfective, unless it's otherwise marked by context, it's going to be talking about the present and future. But you can then use these things in different contexts that are future and past for both of these in the opposite directions. So 
an aspect, as, aspect prominent means the tense is not formally indicated. You have to infer it from the context, from the adverbs and so forth that are being used. So in, in looking at people's analysis of verb systems, I had to at times revise their categories. They would often say, perfective, this is the past tense, and here's the present tense. But when I looked at their past tense, it was, I said, okay, this is the, probably the perfective. Where is the imperfective past? There was no such thing. They say the imperfective is the present. So I looked for the imperfective, perfect, imperfect, the perfective present, and there was no such thing as a perfective present. So basically, you had an imperfective and a perfective. There was no past imperfective. There was no present perfective. So this is a way to try to work through a person's analysis of a given set of data. They may be using the term tense because it's kind of, kind of a European thing. You know, people who speak European languages all have tense. So when you're talking about the verb, let's talk about tense. But we're not talking about European vision of tense. We're talking about aspect prominence versus tense aspect systems. So it's a systemic issue. So now let's look at the distribution of these verbal systems and see what we find. I'm going to take us <clears throat> a little further afield, include Jukonoid in this process, cross river, and then we'll go to the Bantoid and go west to east across Bantoid. Uh, now why Jukonoid? Well, because it's one of the key language sets in this discussion from, from my point of view. So if we look at, the, here we have Cameroon and we have Nigeria and we have the international boundary running here. The, the, the language is spoken within this green domain. Obviously they're spoken elsewhere through diaspora and so forth, but the homeland of these, these languages are as Jukonoid. And over here, the blue are the cross river. This is this one area that since David Crabb was saying, these Bendy languages here really belong within Bantoid, but I left them be here because uh, still, it's what you'll see in the literature up to this point. You even saw it yesterday up in the map of the question mark, but it was still cross river. So basically, you have these cross river languages, and then the orange, this rusty orange outline is for the Bantoid languages. And we'll look at them a little more closely. So what I wanted to do is, if we're going to talk about, as Derek mentioned, the cross river languages, which are neighboring to Bantoid as a possibility, we should look at also the other set of languages that are on the western edge of Bantoid. So we kind of get a clean cut, uh, if there is put to be a cut, so to speak, uh, in terms of the distribution of these systems. So let's look at Jukunai. We'll look at Jukun, uh, Kuteb, and Yukuban, or Yukuban, depending on, I'm not sure how. Oh, oh, oh. Huh? Oh, oh, as they call it. OK. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> So Juku and Shimizu, basically he paints the perfective uh, aspect prominent system. It's, it's, he's straightforward, he understands it. And we have a perfective with zero marking on it. It's the, it's the least minimally marked. Uh, then you have these imperfective, the perfect anterior, and the potential habitual. And what you're going to see is that perfective unmarked carries through all the way. But each language has radically different um, uh, morphemes being used for the other aspects. So here's Kutep, again, perfective, and Kups is basically using an aspect prominent uh, uh, system here and recognizes as such. But he's got very different kind of markers here from the ones we saw. Let's just compare, look at here for, um, for Jukun, Nara, Kyan, Ridi. Now you got Ku and you got a so a pre-verbal pu and a u here. You can't, you can't, you know, you can't do any kind of uh, analysis, historical analysis on these, except the system. Um, Yukvan has zero perfective again, zero unmarked form of the verb. Then you have the imperfective forms again, very differently marked, but it's basically a tense aspect, aspect prominent system. So for Jukanoid. Uh, you see these aspect prominence, you'd probably say, you infer that it's likely the proto jukonoid was an aspect prominent language. The perfective is unmarked, that's something critical to remember. The other exponents uh, are difficult to build anything about the past on because they're so radically different. We come then to the cross river languages over here. And the first of these Bendy languages, the Bekwara, 
Stanford. Um, basically, they didn't talk about verbs in quite the way we are talking about them today. But in reading the, his dissertation, you can see that it's basically an aspect prominent language. Then uh, Kirti and Ekpang, in talking with him, he did a, a, a bachelor's degree, a thesis, on the Utuguan language. And he's the speaker of Boki himself. We talked through these aspect and tense aspect systems. And basically, it's an aspect prominent language. Uh, Boki and Utuguan both. And those are cl they're very closely related uh, within this Bende group. So let's go on then to Upper Cross. Mbembe, similarly to Stanford's dissertation, Barnwell, Katie Barnwell didn't describe the verb system exactly the way we're talking about it today, but as you read through, you'll see the references are largely interpretable in aspect terms, not tense terms. But then we have clear marking here in Legbo, uh, one of Larry's uh, groups. Larry got together with students, and they looked and they began to realize we're not dealing with the tense system. We're dealing with perfective, imperfective, ritual perfection, and so forth. And notice again, the perfective here is zero mark, just like generally in the Bendy language, you'll see that zero marking. It's the minimal marking, let's say. Now that's, in this case, it's just with CV roots. They do have an E suffix with CV roots and, um, uh, and CVC roots, some CV roots and all CVC roots. The ERE, another cro upper cross, they have they've perfected, they call it the past simple, the local community, the present continuous. Makes sense, you know, if you're thinking about tense. But actually it's a perfective, an imperfective, and a habitual. Uh, this mm. perfective has an A suffix on it. Then we go down to lower cross. We'll look at Bibio and Obolo. Ibibio, uh, this is es uh, Essien's work. And uh, I reinterpreted that this, this is really perfective, imperfective, habitual on the grounds that I gave earlier in terms of the model of an aspect prominent language. Here, the perfective has this very clear pre prefix ma, uh, and the imperfective looks like it has least marking. Maybe tone is what's separating. And then again, of course, other exponents for other, other aspects. Obolo is a curious uh, situation. Which Aaron wants to divide it between non-future tense and future tense. And the non-future tense is aspect prominent. The future tense is tense. According to this, you have you have a perfective, simple perfective, simple imperfectives, definite perfective, definite perfective, and so forth in the future. But when you're talking about the non-future, straightforward aspect system. So it's a curious development. If you thought, stop and think about what we we're talking about, it, it, it makes sense. You, you'll read uh, some other places in the literature too. There's other people describe the, lang the language they've been working on as having the future, non-future kind of contrast. And I think you know, cognitively it makes some sense because if you think of an aspect prominent language, you have the perfective gives you ground in the past. The imperfective allows you to develop the, the present quite often stays into the future. But you could say the future is really not fully <coughs> developed. So languages are searching, <coughs> searching for ways to clarify the future. And that uh, like some languages will have certain adverbial forms that repeat all the time for the future <coughs> marking. So that is, it is a, it's a, probably a fertile area for people to develop uh, other kinds of categories. John, can I just say what was one quick thing there? There's an area in West Africa in Magic Congo He's actually like there's a whole bunch of languages have a future tense, period. Yeah. Strange. So just, you're just like this. Yes. 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 So, um, and then the Cross River conclusion. So there's definitely aspect prominent in the Cross River. And likely if you were reconstructing it, you'd probably say it's aspect prominent. Um, Connell wasn't disagreeing with you. He was just saying, look at Ogoni. I think there might be t some tense there. It might be a language that's developed tense uh, spontaneously within itself. <coughs> uh, then also he's pointing out probably it would never be Laura Cross anyway involved in this because it, time wise Bantu had already been off and running before Laura Cross could even deal with these kind of issues so they wouldn't be part of developing a tense process. Uh, so that's those are the basic. Let's move on to Bantoid now. Now Bantoid. If there was no Laura Cross, there was also no Laura Cross. Pardon? If there was no Laura Cross, then there was no Laura Cross, right? But it was just cross. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Annoyed. Yeah, what uh, this is uh, cross river inclusions, yeah. yeah. For lower and upper together. Yeah. 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 So the, um, so the Bantoid, 
uh, we have here the tevoid area here with one, and then um, we have uh, the Jarawan group. They have, like, I think there's one language over in Cameroon that still has a few hundred speakers. Most of it's over here in the north. That's a whole different story. Then we have Echoid and we have Nyan. We're going to look at those first. Now notice this is, this whole area here is lowland. It's, at the most it's about a thousand, about three, 300 meters above sea level up here around McCurdy uh, and here. But uh, down, down here it's about 30 meters above sea level or 40 meters above sea level. So this is a forested area, very low, very low land. And then over here, we're going at the 1,500 to 2,500 feet of meters above sea level. So people are living at five to 7,500 feet in feet. Um, and we know Mount Cameroon, this whole thing is a volcanic line along here. And some geologists say it goes all the way up to Libya. So it's a, it's a fissure in the earth that allowed for volcanoes in Malabo. Mount Cameroon is still an active volcano. And there's potential in some other places along that, that line. So there's a big, you have to, have to think of an escarpment here, big escarpment that just stands up like a wall. And people, people aren't going to be rubbing shoulders every day with each other up and down that escarpment. People in Batsibo aren't going down the mountain every day and talk. You have traders that are going back and forth, but it isn't like everybody's just going to the same marketplace. So let's look at these, the Western group. We've got Tiv, Jar and Kulung from Jarawan, Ejagam, and Denya representing these different groups. So Tiv, uh, Abraham, 1940, he saw them as past and present and so forth. But you look at it closer and you begin to see that these are aspects again. And uh, basically tone pattern here seems to distinguish it from uh, the constituent focus form. Uh, the imperfective has this ngu pre-verb. I don't know, it might be part of the nga. Um, OK. Um, thank you. The jad. Uh, is uh, got perfective, imperfective, habitual, very straightforward uh, aspects <coughs> system in, um, in, in Jarawan, and same with Kulum again. They gave them different titles, but it's a zero and marked perfective here, uh, least marked. Moving to a Jagam, similarly, it's a per aspect prominent language with uh, with various. Here's the Ag we've seen before. We've seen Key that uh, that um, and Key was also in Ebola. Should have mentioned that. Uh, Dania is basically an tense aspect system, I mean, aspect prominent system uh, with variations in the perfective and then the imperfective and so forth. So it's fairly straightforward that the continuation of what we saw down in Jukanoid and the Cross River continues on in this east western part of Bantoid. It's a continuation of the Niger Congo inheritance. It comes uh, from Proto Niger Congo, is what we're, we would be saying. Now we move into the western side where we look at Tibeboid, the grass fields, set of languages and grass fields, Dakoid, and no, I have no verbal data at all on that, so we'll skip that, but Mambiloid and, and Tikar. Uh, this is work by uh, Hyman, 1981, on tense aspect in Tibeboid. It's clearly got tense. <laughs> it's got four, well, three past tense, we could say, in a present tense. And, uh, and then it's got uh, three futures in that immediate future, this, this kind of present, immediate past, immediate future distinction. But we go to then for the ring, Babungo. Babungo has a set of past tenses. But interestingly, when you come here, what do you get for the future? You get basically the imperfective. That's the inheritance from Niger Congo. They haven't gone and done anything with the future here. But notice over in, in Bedboid, um, they, they have. They've, they've contrasted the perfective from imperfective. But when you get to Babungo, they've, done elaborate, they've elaborated the past, but they haven't really elaborated the future. Similarly, Ring and Agam has these various past tenses, but it comes to the future. Again, they haven't elaborated the future. So you see something going on here. As the language begins to you know, use tense, they don't necessarily use it everywhere. And the future is out there as a little different than the past. And to be using the imperfective as just the cover for the future. Looking at Mundani, we have a similar situation here. And then the data, I suspect, the question here is in the future, 
do they really have these? I could, I could see examples of these, but I couldn't see examples of these, but I couldn't get the negative saying there is no such thing. Uh, that's something to be researched further. Uh, in in Yi, uh, in Momo area, they have a couple past tense, or you can almost say one past tense, and then the future, they do, they do elaborate a kind of a contrast between the, the uh, two futures that are, they, own, they may actually be variants. I only had a few days to collect this data, so I wouldn't, it's tentative in that sense. Uh, Yembong, which is a Bimeleke language in the, in the Bam Kam group within grass fields, has an elaborate system going back to four pasts and four futures. It has this big uh, tense zero and then these four futures. So you see, we continue on then to Mambiloid. There's past tense again, perfective, imperfective. And coming down here, though, uh, it's not clear that they have anything other than the imperfective in the future. Open question. And then to Tikar, Avute, they have these tenses again, the past tense. Coming down to the future, they have a future one that basically is imperfective. This future two is basically perfective, and that's, that's the only place I've seen that kind of a combination, but it's obviously a piece of work still. And then Stanley with T-Car, you have your past tenses again, three of them here, and you have a future two that basically just uses the imperfective. So what we have, oh, let me get that map there. Okay, so what we have is this gray line is the Cameroon volcanic line. <coughs> put these uh, little triangles to indicate the higher points, the uh, mountains, there's all mountains here. And so you have the, here's the Bebboid, here's the um, bomb, the grass fields, here we have uh, Mambiloid and uh, we have Tikar here, I'm getting down into the bomb languages here. This red zone is basically the area where tense aspect is developed. It's all in the mountains, it's all high land, uh, area, and then it comes down into the lower valleys of the Sonica River river basin here. And then these red lines coming out here are just basically Bantu, number 11 Bantu. You've got Akosi over here, and then Balundu and so forth, and then across to other uh, Bantu languages here, the Bantu Zone A languages. So Cameroon Volcanic Line, the mountains of West Cameroon, served as a type of boundary between Bantoid languages spoken in the plains and forests closer to sea level, and the Bantoid languages spoken at 1,500 to 2,500 meters higher in the mountains of West Cameroon. The Bantoid groups have produced systems with multiple tenses, such as Baiboid, Bamkam, Tikar, Mundani, maybe Kababungo. Some have produced limited set of past tenses, Agam, Gim, Mandila. Some have produced weak or no future tense system in the future. And so if, as as uh, Derek was presenting, if the Proto-Bantu verb system reflects an early form of the developing Bantu system, then we might expect, what? That it was part of a limited set of past tenses. So the one, the language is kind of in the periphery around, outside of Mbamkam and Beboid, who have fewer past tenses, may really <laughs> represent an older form, but they haven't elaborated it. And the Bamilike, the Beboid, maybe the Momo, got excited about their tenses and developed more of them and more of them. Uh, the limited no future, this is very, you can see why Derek was having problems trying to find a future for Proto-Bantu. And you can see the problems with the future in these languages. It's not clear that they developed a clear sense of how to mark future apart from the imperfective. It seemed to be serving fine, apparently, in most of these languages. And that points to the fact that probably languages like Bamkam, Bedboy, have had all these languages have had a lot of time, and some of them have taken the time to experiment with other growth and development of their tense system. Uh, and we're talking about millennia, you know, we're not talking about a few years, millennia of time. Uh, while Bantu was expanding, they were experimenting, <laughs> so to speak, back home. So, a reasonable form of the Bantu verb system that uh, Derek presents seems very reasonable relative to what we find up there in the grass fields area and the, the highlands of West Cameroon. Now, why innovate tense? I mean, this is for my last piece, uh, so I'm not <coughs> here, but let me just propose, make a proposal. 
we know that the proposal is the following. Innovation took place when the perfective took on more frequent use in present tense of context, such as narratives, procedural discourse. And we know, like, like Hopper uh, suggest, you know, pointed out, the foregrounding is usually done through the perfective uh, aspect. And we look at, you look at these languages that have aspect prominent, it's basically the perfective that carries the storyline forward, carries the, the, the various discourse forward. So, um, but it, it also can take on present tense in certain contexts. Uh, we do that even in English when we're telling the story often. And uh, so it opened up cognitive space for development of a new recent past. In other words, if we keep using this thing for present tense more and more, how do we just say something happened a week ago or two weeks ago? And so open, they opened the possibility of trying to develop something. So the innovation was pursued more robustly in some languages than by others. And at the time of the Proto-Bantu, it was likely a minimal development focused on one or two past tenses and the possibility of future tenses using material already in place, that is the imperfective. So we have a comment I made about Hooper, Hopper, Hopper the Obolodenia Ejagum, using perfective as a, as a main uh, storyline, narrative line, default past tenses, so we have, I won't get it, we don't have time to get into that part. Um, so, and then Derek points out that the perfective appears to be, have become the present tense, separate from what he and I have been talking about. You know, he said, come from his side, I was reading his 2008 work, the, the perfective looks like it became the present tense in Bantu. It's the unmarked form, and often, like I was thinking, like an, even an Agam Larry, the story, we look, suddenly we're getting these verb forms, and they're unmarked. It's the old perfective form serving that role. And so new possibilities for new kind of tenses uh, opened up, that, uh, or, or development of tense at all. So basically start in past tense, and so on and so forth, as you've seen, and we've gone through. So I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> So we have some 15 minutes for your most urgent questions and comments. <laughs> Derek, you should be up here too. <laughs> There's a seat here. <coughs> so you can ask questions of Derek too. Absolutely. You can send all the questions to Derek. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's the one who motivated me to do this study, so he's ready. So appreciate him very much. All right. Larry? Yeah. Yes, thank you, both of you. This is really great. Let, let, let me just first summarize what I think I got. So everything in the verb stem in Bantu is aspectual. So all the, the suffixal stuff and all the innovative tense stuff, except for the key card you showed, mm -hmm. is happening before it, like this. Is that right? Is that an accurate thing? And then when, when the suffixal stuff is now involved in tense systems in current day Bantu languages, that's all innovative. Um, Right. There, there, there are a few places in the where you have innovation of aspects pre-verbal in the ban, ban, ban So they can be renewal. But yeah, some kind of renewal. So your generalization yeah. is right. Yeah. Right. So what's interesting to me is that in a number of contexts, of it, particularly for some of the things that you ended with, John, um, if you look at places where you you don't get as many contrasts, and you have the tenses developing the main clause affirmative, mm -hmm. and with negatives you often don't have as many tenses. Right. Right in the consecutive kind of things, and, you know, those kind of things, they may just have a binary distinction, like in, you know, the, the grass fields languages generally have tenses, but if you look at, um, let's say, the, um, the, the eastern grass, the Bambile case system, you typically get a nasal perfective, yes. and something looking very subjunctive-like mm -hmm. in the imperfective mm -hmm. of the future. And that yeah. looks almost like their western brothers, the sisters. Yeah. yeah. But. But so that would be the older, yeah, the older binary distinction exactly. in yeah. aspect yeah. that is preserved in the consecutive clauses. Consecutive clauses, yeah. yeah. That's, that's cool. a good point. That's actually, yeah. Cool. yeah, good insight. Yannicka? Yeah, I have a question for Derek. Actually, two questions, um, uh, and very narrow. Um, why would you uh, reconstruct a uh, and not da, as Mielsen did for the uh, present disjunct? Um, and also, um, did I understand correctly that you want to reconstruct the, that disjunct uh, for proto mm -hmm. But I, if you in the database that I was using, uh, disjunctive marked by a rather than 
Yeah, no doubt. They're much more frequent than in the radios I was using. That was quite infrequent. Right. Um, so if you look at um, that, that may be an artifact of the of the database then, because uh, there are many languages okay. that uh, uh, that have the um, na or la. Um, and these kinds of forms. Um, so the question would then be: Would it me be more likely that they lose or, or um, soften the, uh, uh, the the consonant, or that uh, these languages innovated the the n, or that it comes from somewhere else? Yeah, that that's hard to interpret. I mean, Larry and I batted this around a good a good deal by email that about uh, the consonants basically disappearing. Well, it's a nice idea, but concrete examples are rather few and far between. So I'm not concrete sure examples of? of? Of L or R disappearing. And, and, you know, are these connected? I mean, I'm open to suggest they might be connected. I don't mm -hmm. see much concrete evidence that they are connected. Okay, yes. And then the, this R is for protobuntu, you say? I think, yeah. Why not for East? Sorry, why not? The, the, the present disjunct, I mean, um, uh, the, the, as the conjoint disjoint alternation is really restricted to Eastern <coughs> languages, mm -hmm. so why would you reconstruct it um, uh, to a higher node? Yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure how far it was present in the forest languages. Mm -hmm. So that, for that reason, I, I'm not sure about this distribution of forest languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think Tara had a question. Okay. I have a quick um, comment mostly, and then I have a big question about methodness that I think I'll have to formulate and, and send to you later. Um, <laughs> but uh, what you mentioned that this key uh, persistent um, the meaning in the forest languages is a bit hard to reconcile. Um, and you said it has already and eventually in the future. I think the eventually and future markers are quite natural um, evolutions of the idea of of still, like we see this in English, um, in German, and I think French, if I'm not mistaken, where still can mean like, yes, we're still doing it, but it also has this counterfactual meaning where someone assumes you're not doing it anymore, and you say, no, we're still doing that, and then that develops very naturally into a future marker. Um, we're still eating, um, and, and so I think those, uh, the already, I'm, I'm not aware of, because still and already are sort of on opposite and some opposite corners of facial polarity, so I'm not, I can't quite figure out. You can go why uh, not yet. Why yeah, 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 yeah. So, so still, yeah. yeah. So there is a, there is a pathway, but it's a little bit. Yeah, it's in the same, and they, and they also overlapped um, temporally already and still, like, they both mean things that are happening at the reference time. So I, I think there, there's okay. a, a pretty good story that can be told about how those kind of Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, and what's your other horrible big question? Well, I just don't, I'm just I'm just trying to wrap my head around perfective being marked versus unmarked, and this this idea of a zero morpheme being inherited um, <laughs> at, at all. W when I know that it's it's very common cross linguistically anyway to have um, no nope. present tenses that are just unmarked, and so I I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I can't even formulate my question, obviously. But, but one, 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 yeah. one piece of that, I think, if you say present tense, that's probably true, because that's what happens when you get to the Bantu, the present tense unmarked, because it's using the old perfective, which is not used in a tense system, it's used in the aspect prominent system. And it's the perfective that's the unmarked in the aspect prominent system. So it shifts roles. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I can see that from a development perspective when it that's why I didn't. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. <laughs> well, you should mention it. Sure, it might be a point of good, good learning. You know, I mean, yeah. whatever, whatever ideas you have, you need to share with us. Yeah. But is, is that not rather a question of not reconstructing individual tense aspect morphemes or, or affixes, but rather reconstructing a construction? Yeah, that's what put it by. I guess that's that's. Yeah. It's it's not yeah it's kind of strange uh, to reconstruct a zero morphine, but it, you just have a construction ending in, in, in a final A and nothing marked in, in the pre stem that then you don't need to reconstruct the zero morphine. Yeah, I, yeah, you're talking about in the Bantu. 
yeah. situation. Yeah, I, I won't speak to that. Yeah. I was hoping you wouldn't raise that. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Devon's new book, yeah. The Story of Zero. Yeah. <laughs> I think Thilo wanted to say something, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have two questions. One about the. Yannick has already addressed. The other one is about the, the math. Do you reconstruct the, uh, some math for, for Potobantu? No. No. No, they're, no. All, they're all transparent from Mala. Yeah. But um, they, there's math for perfective, I think, uh, or anterior, some perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, perfect. Uh, perfect. And out, rest, both. Out, outside Bantu as well. Yeah. And you you had it there. Yeah, and you have yes, you have a uh, ma on the accord but language. Do you have any every yeah? It's also Kordofanian in, in the Kordofanian or Iban group has right. ma for yeah. whenever ma uh, whenever mm -hmm. English New Testament has a verb form with has or have. Yeah. Then it's got ma there. It's yeah. got ma there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the rest, it has verb stems. Uh, Different verb stems marked uh, with different final vowels, more or less. It's not as, it's more like Russian, bit messy, but uh, that's one of the basic things. Yeah. Um, is there a possibility of a verb uh, finishing that was much older and had g gave r rise to these different marks in different branches of Niger Congo? I don't know. I don't know. The echo, the word for finish, is man. To, so it seems to be in Ekwe, this seems fairly uh, that is clear, straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Other places I, I can't speak, yeah. I won't speak yeah. widely about yeah. it, but it's quite transparent in that part of uh, the Bantoid. And let, let, me just, well. yeah. let me just make a comment about the marking of zero yes. and so forth. Probably what I should say there is just it's it's the minimal form of the verb. Then what is it? You just call it that. It's the minimal form of the verb. You know, it's a CBC verb, it's CBC verb. Doesn't seem to have. Now sometimes it'll be tone, contrast, and so forth. But just to say it's a uh, you know zero is being inherited and so forth. It's just not marked. But we saw some perfectives that were marked with the suffix. So it's not it's not immune to being suffixed. Mm -hmm. Roger. Uh, sorry, John. I really completely disbelieve your story. Um, <laughs> Uh, first, uh, just a general point is my, move, my ideas have actually moved on in the last 20 years. I can see from my presentation yesterday, so I really don't believe the introductory stuff that you said. But my main thing is that I can't see any reason for not thinking about Kainji and Plato if, if the story is correct. And if so, then as far as I can see, there definitely are Plato and Kainji languages that have tense exactly in the sense that you're mm -hmm. describing here. My view then is that there's an opposite model, which is mainly that there were tense-like systems in proto anyway, Congo which have eroded and collapsed. And one reason they've put eroded and collapsed is influence from Chadic languages. Chadic, um, Plateau and Kainji have interacted for millennia. Chadic certainly has a spectral system, and I think this type of interaction has caused the collapse of tense-like systems which were in fact present in, at the proto Banui congo level. Um, and I can, you know, there definitely are languages that, you know, meld, meld if you like, really marked tense-like systems, I think, in plateau uh, with a spectral system. So I, I'm really not you're saying, buying your You're story. saying the Jarawan one is not surrounded by Chadwick? Jarawan is surrounded by plateau mostly, but yeah, nearly all. The, in, in the northern Jarawan languages have some Chadic, and the uh, yeah. languages like Mbila and... And what Chadic influence would there be on the western Bambo Bantoid? Like the Ekwai, the Tib, yes. and so forth? Well, if, if indeed they are coming out of the, um, the, the, the confluence, then of course there is influence, you know, there's definitely a some sort of influence between. But then it would be the same influence on Kainji, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, Western Kainji has certainly been influenced by Chalik, no, yeah. no doubt about it at all. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, but, uh, and I, I would, probably the next thing I would say, if that's true, then probably there's a different history to be told by Kainji and Plateau that, that uh, then the one that's told here with Bantoid and Jarawan, and Ju, excuse me, and 
Juconoid and the Cross River. I, I don't know. I mean, you, but anyway, it's fine. You don't have to buy this. That's. <laughs> I would, I would like to see the counter explanations besides Plato and Kanji use this data and give us the con counter process that took place with Bantu and Bantoi. That would help me enormously, like the counter arguments. Right, right, but the important piece of evidence is that you, in my view, do have these 10 slack systems in Plato and Kanji, only sporadically, but they're there. Yeah, but we, we talked about Guadi also having it and understanding that. But it, it, uh, we basically, one of the principles, and you say you don't buy this principle, I guess, that aspect is is, is basic, and tense is always an accretion on an aspect. No, no I, I do buy that as a okay. general principle. Okay. It's just that it's a question of where this arises historically, and I'm, I'm not buying your claim that it's historical. What, what is the historical claim you think I made? Well, the tense becomes more prominent in, in the sort of Bantoid eastern area and the proto benue Congo. No, I didn't say anything about proto benue Congo. No, well, but you're saying it arises in certain eastern languages, right? Yes. Yes? In, in the western ben Bantoid, yes, Cross exactly. River, and Juconoid, yeah. And yeah. I want to say, no, no, this goes further back to the level of proto benue Congo. Okay, so benue Congo is aspect prominent. Benue Congo already has tense systems. That's that's the claim. Okay. That's the claim. okay. Yes. So I think. Sorry, we have to stop here before our time. And Derek wants to have a final no, uh, closing it's statement. No, 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 it's not, it's not about just one thing. That someone asked me an interesting question yesterday, which might be interesting for many of you, and that is, how quickly can systems change since we've had thousands of years here? Uh, there's one. There's one case which is very well documented. There's a little language spoken down near Mombasa called Daiso. Daiso is a language related to Kikuyu. Kikuyu is distinguished, and those languages like Kikuyu, three pasts, three futures, and all they have range of suffixes. Daiso speakers were met by the Portuguese. Well, they didn't exactly shake hands, but the Portuguese recorded them in 1500, moving down the Tana River south. This language was then, their language was then recorded by a German in 1900. Now the change that had taken place presumably didn't take place in 1900, they'd taken place before 1900. So somewhere between 1500 and before 1900, the system doesn't look like Kikuyu at all anymore. The suffixes are all gone, there's one past, <laughs> there's one future. It looks like Shamba, and where is it spoken? It's only by Shamba. So under the influence of a, of a new language, the whole system in, in less than 400 years has been totally dismantled. So these changes can take place rather quickly, apparently. And then given that we've got some, several thousand years, we're talking about here, all kinds of things are possible. Yeah, but this volcanic, your volcanic line, if I understand well, this would be a linguistic border since 4,000, 5,000 years, that, that's somehow contradictory then. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it's always those issues where you have some generalization, and then you have an exception. So, you know, it's like a proves the generalization. Yeah, which worked out, and that's some real proof, I guess. <laughs>